This doesn't work, does it? Of course not. NES games don't work on the Super NES, or as we have here, Famicom games on the Super Famicom. That would be crazy, surely if it were possible we'd have heard of it by now, right? Yes, okay, there are those adapters that have appeared from China recently, all unofficial of course. They really just use the Super NES as a power supply and controller for a cheap NES clone, with a separate video output, which has got to be cheating, you might as well buy a separate console. But the idea of the SNES being truly backwards compatible with the NES isn't completely ridiculous. Rumour has long held that that was the original plan before being ditched halfway through the console's development. Traces of it are said to remain though. Some vague architectural similarities are still there, but maybe the biggest apparent link with the past is the Super NES CPU. The Western Design Center 65C816. Apart from the catchy name, this might seem like a strange choice, because it's not all that fast, but it is by itself backwardly compatible with the MOS 6502, the CPU the NES was based around. In fact, it's really just a souped up version of it. The 6502 in a 16-bit hat. Code that runs on the NES will mostly run on this CPU too, but that alone is not enough to make NES games work. No, that's not happening because everything else in the system is really quite different, and it's not just that the cartridge slot is too big. The SNES can speak the same language as the NES, but it doesn't do any good because the instructions don't make any sense. To actually play NES on SNES, you'd need some kind of emulator or something of that variety, wouldn't you? Yes indeed, but surely such a wonderful thing doesn't exist. Well, it does now, in the form of the amazing Project Nested. Now I know what you're thinking, this is probably just some janky proof of concept, right? Jerky, slow and unplayable, created just to score nerd points in some obscure message board thread. It couldn't possibly be running NES games playably, could it? Well, it can, and it is. In fact, that is what you're looking at right now. Yes, all the original NES games you've seen so far are running on this emulator. And no, it's not an adapter cart. It doesn't require any special add-ons. It's not using any enhancement chips to increase the power of the SNES. There's no Super FX or SA1. It's running on the base hardware, and my god, is it impressive. What's the catch? Well, so far, compatibility isn't all that great. Only 31 games are actually running close to perfect, with another 100 or so pretty playable at the moment, and maybe a few more good ones that haven't been tested yet. Yes, there's still some way to go, but what's here is already worth looking at. Lorraine Corville from Quebec, aka myself086, is the one behind this, and it really is quite an amazing achievement. I've been lucky enough to be able to speak to him in person and get some info directly. So how did this all start? Where did the idea come from? Well, it all sprang from his development of a standard PC emulator and grew up from there. It went pretty well, but there's no challenge to it. It was already running full speed. So I needed something, um, I needed a challenge. So an idea I had was NES on SNES. But it seems way too tight because uh, you only have double the clock cycles on the SNES versus yeah. NES. Mm -hmm. So for, for the next three years, it was in the back of my mind, like, thinking of how it would be possible. Uh, the math, the mathematics behind it finally added up to 100% performance. And that's when I started coding it. Was he surprised at just how well it works now? It's better than um, it's better than what I had thought of in 2018. It's a little bit better, not by much, because I I was doing the math yeah. on how well it would run. Because if it doesn't run 100%, there's no point for me to yeah. make it. So mm -hmm. I just knew how many times each instruction are executed per frame on average. And just multiply by the overhead and kind of get an idea of how fast it runs. My math was about 5% off when I first implemented everything. It took about a month to implement yeah. most uh, most of the optimizations. 
That's some confidence, but it is entirely warranted in this case because it does what it does very well. It's incredible it's not just running older, simpler NES games, but he's making a very good job of running some of the system's more demanding titles. The ones that in many cases require enhancement chips or mappers as they are often called, extra power built into the cartridge, which complicates emulation. Super Mario Bros. 3 here is an MMC3 game, one of the most common chips from the later part of the NES's lifespan. It works pretty well as you can see, though it's not perfect yet. There are a couple of show-stopping bugs that make the game crash at certain points, but it's close enough to make it seem like good emulation of this and a whole lot of other games really is possible. Unfortunately, you can't say the same about all the classics yet. The Japanese version of Castlevania will just about run, but very slowly. The Western release won't even go this far, one of quite a number of games that just totally fail at the moment. But that is set to improve, and Mr Corville has a pretty good idea of what percentage of games we could expect to see in the future. At least 50% fully playable game. Yeah, I think it's very ambitious, but I think it's possible. That sounds pretty promising. It would be amazing if so many games were running, but are there some games that are going to be especially challenging? Some that we might never see running? Well, yes, the most likely Punch-Out is one that is off the table for the time being. Why? Well, its enhancement chip is the MMC2, and this is apparently a bitch to emulate. Uh, this mapper can change bank mid-scan line when it draws character uh, F, E, or F, D. And it can also do that with sprites, which is the biggest problem. Uh, background, not so much, because I can use window to kind of say, oh, from this part, it draws with these characters, and then it switches. But doing it with sprites, um, I don't think that's going to happen. But what are we likely to see soon? We are currently on Project Nested 1.3, but what will the next update 1.4 likely bring? Right now, I'm working on Super Mario Bros. 2 because the graphics are wrong, and if you play the USA version, mm -hmm. it resets as soon as you see the Shy Guy, which I did reverse engineer, and I know what the problem is. And once I fix it, it's going to fix a lot of other games that also reset something happened. Now I also brought up Elite with Luron, the major NES limit pusher I've looked at before. Could we ever expect to see that? Well, it's in the works. Elite is going to be my target game when it comes to optimizing uh, on the EXE, like ahead of time aggressive optimizations. I'm going to be using that specific game to to try and get it up to normal speed, or even better, if possible. Yes, he does have plans to get Elite running perhaps even better on the SNES than the NES original, with an improved frame rate. That would be fairly mind-blowing, an overclocked NES on the SNES. This whole thing is shaping up to be pretty interesting. That's all we're going to hear from the creator of Project Nested for now, but he may be back in a future video, but more on that later. Well, so far you've seen this running on a PC emulator. The output is very crisp. An emulator on an emulator, that's fine, but the devil is in the details. This wouldn't be the first ambitious project that worked fine on an emulator, but not anywhere else. How about the real hardware? Does it work there? I will show it you in the flesh in a moment, but first of all, let's talk about how you actually get it working, because it's not that difficult, but it does take a few steps. For each game you want to play, you'll need to create a playable SNES ROM file from the original ROM with the Project Nested PC application. This might look a bit daunting, but it's not so bad really. If you follow the steps listed at the top, it should go fairly smoothly. There's a lot of advanced settings which some games need to run, but the official compatibility list, which the app links to, has notes on this. It's just a case of ticking boxes, usually. Once you've created your SNES executable file, you're ready to go, either with an emulator or by sticking it on a flashcard. 
And I should point out that it's not particularly fussy about what sort of flash cart you're using. My cheap knockoff Super EverDrive China version works just fine. One important thing though, as you actually play the games, it creates a save file which helps with the emulation in the future. After you've played the game for a while, you can go back to the app and reincorporate the new save file into your SNES file and the game will often run better. With some games this doesn't seem to make much difference, but with others it's huge. But enough of that, let's dive into it on the real hardware. So let's take a look at Super Mario Bros. first of all. Yeah, you've seen this in action before, but here it is looking particularly fine. There's a few graphical glitches, a few dropped frames here and there. You definitely wouldn't want to do a speedrun on this, but well, as a casual player, it's 99% of the way there and really it plays just fine. And it does look better than I've ever seen it running on the original hardware, at least in terms of the actual picture. The best you could ever really hope for on most of the original NES or Famicom models was Composite Out and that generally didn't look all that good. Most Super NES models had native RGB output and even here on my unforgiving modern flat panel, it really does look very good indeed. But you've seen Super Mario Brothers running many times before, I'm sure you've probably even seen it on the Super NES, thanks to Super Mario All-Stars. So let's try something a bit different, maybe a bit more challenging. So this is Adventure Island 2 looking just as good as Super Mario Brothers did. It plays really, really well with very little noticeable difference from it running on the original hardware. Kind of random what game work and what games don't at the moment but this is one that definitely does work great. One of those games that ends up on pirate multi-carts a lot of the time often hacked to feature Mario instead of whoever it is that this is currently featuring. And weirdly I think it might be some Hudson Soft executive or somebody who ended up in the, in the title role of this game kind of Hudson Soft's equivalent of Mario. Takahashi Meijin is his name, I've just looked it up, but that's by the by and completely irrelevant, let's move on. Prisoner of War from SNK, maybe not absolutely their finest hour, but still it's a pretty decent game from the era before. SNK really took off in the fighting game arena. Yeah, it looks superb. Again, manly men pounding the hell out of each other in a prisoner of war camp. No guns allowed, just fists in a game that I'm sure has absolutely no homoerotic subtext in it, no matter how hard you look. Pretty impressive, and if 50% of NES games end up working this well, well, Project Nested will be a pretty major success. Now on to a game that might be a bit of a surprise to anyone already familiar with Project Nested because it's it's not actually supposed to work. Yes, it's IREM's Holy Diver and it's based on a fairly obscure mapper that's not actually supported yet. How have I got it working? Well, it's via an MMC3 hack that I was able to download. Yeah, somebody's released a patch that'll turn it into the much more common MMC3 cartridge type. That makes it a lot easier to get working on some types of flash carts. It makes it easier to make repros and those pirate multi carts. And it also means that it works on this emulator. And it seems to be darn near perfect. The only problem I noticed with it was uh, some graphical glitches that occurred after you can continue after a game over. Another one that might be a surprise, it's Splatterhouse One Paku Graffiti. I probably said that wrong. Again, this uses an unsupported mapper, but there is an MMC3 hack out there, which means it will now work here. This is definitely way more glitchy, but it's still playable and definitely bodes well for what might happen in future updates. I did try a lot of other games with MMC3 hacks to see if they worked as well as these two, but I didn't really have nearly so much success with anything else. One last one before I move on with the video. This is Mitsume Gatoru, another game I'm sure not to be able to pronounce correctly. A game that I've talked about before in another video and one that I'm quite excited to see running. It's a bit of a limit pushing, demanding NES game, so it's great to see it working here. 
particularly here on level 2 with this scrolly background parallax effect. It's not absolutely perfect, there's a few glitches, but it's pretty close. This is a native MMC3 game and makes use of the cartridge's enhancement chip to make that background effect possible. It's swapping the character graphics in and out to make it appear like there's another background scrolling layer and the emulation must be pretty accurate for this to work. Yeah, I've picked out a load of games here that do work very well. I could have showed you some games that don't work, but it's not really that interesting to look at most of the time. It's just stuff not working and blank screens. And occasionally, if you're lucky, you might see an error screen like this one here. But I'm sure you've got the idea of what it's like running on the real hardware now. I'm going to stop wittering in an unscripted way and go back to the pre-recorded voiceover I did before. OK, you've seen it in action now, but at this point I'm sure some of you are wondering how exactly does this all work? How is this possible? Well, I'm kind of wondering the same thing myself at the moment. Laron has been good enough to explain a lot to me, but well, I'm really struggling to grasp it. So I think that's going to have to wait for now. Yes, this definitely needs some deeper explanation, so there's going to be a part two of this video that goes into more detail. You know I love limit pushing stuff and this might be the most limits pushingest thing I've ever seen. It's very clever and I'm looking forward to dissecting it soon if I possibly can. If you're interested in this I do recommend checking out Project Nested for yourself. There's a link below and a link to the Nesdev forum thread where this is being discussed. Requests are gladly accepted as well as compatibility reports. I should also mention the Myself086 Patreon page. There's a link round about here somewhere. If you'd like to support Laron and this project, you can do so here. I really hope this generates some interest. I'm excited about what this thing is and what it could become, so I hope this brings him some patrons. As I say, there is more on this topic on the horizon. I really do want to understand more about how it works, but I also wanted to get a quick video out as soon as possible. This is definitely my cup of tea, and I hope it's yours too, if you do drink tea. Yeah, and I'll also mention my own Patreon here too, if you'd like to help me out and support me in making videos, that would be wonderful. Also, there's a link down below and up above. Thank you as ever to my own generous patrons, your number is increasing slowly and that's great, thanks for your support guys. So for now I'm going to sign off and say thanks for watching and I'll see you next time folks.